Hi, Philasm here from nowspinning.co.uk and this is a special review looking back at an absolute classic album. And I've been wanting to do this for a long time. There's the clue. I was reading, as you do, uh, a copy of New Musical Express from April 27th, 1974. And there's a press ad, which I'll bring up now, which shows status quo or on their quo tour, tour. And the support band was a band called Montrose. This is 1974. And that's when this album basically changed my life. You all know, or many of you do, whether you follow me on this channel or on Facebook or wherever else you've discovered me, that Deep Purple mean a lot to me. My favourite band, probably. What am I saying? Probably they are. But of all the thousands of albums on CD and vinyl I have, if I had to pick one, only one that I could take with me um, on a spaceship to another planet, it would have to be this one. The first Montrose album, the debut album. This to me is the perfect debut album of all time for rock fans. Possibly the first ever heavy metal album to come out of America. Um, it rivaled anything. It could have, they could, this band could have been absolutely huge, but we all know Ronnie Montrose was, he didn't like to put the same pair of shoes on more than once, did he? But this is just perfect. I discovered it by an older brother of a friend of mine who'd bought it. And he just, he didn't, this is a guy who didn't really speak a lot. He'd go around to my mate's house after school. And he put this on and he'd started with side two. And I just, I'd never heard anything so powerful in my life. Um, and, and another thing for all of you vinyl lovers out there, who think that everything has to be a 180 gram or 200 gram vinyl. Just look at this. This is probably the thinnest vinyl I've ever seen. It's absolutely bendy beyond belief. But the sound of this is so pristine. It sounds like it came out next week. Now it was produced by Ted Templeman who is a genius. Back in 1973, 74, I didn't know anything about producers. All I knew was what anything sounded like. Um, and this was a guy who was the Warner Brothers producer. He'd done Van Morrison, the Doobie Brothers. Everything he touched, everything he still touches, sounds like it came out yesterday. And with this album, he knew exactly what he wanted to do. On Rock the Nation, there are 11 guitar overdubs, full distortion. Was there ever a point before this where guitars were so full of, of distortion and riffology like the first Montrose album? And we're talking about stuff from the States. But this album, to me, was so important. And it's almost like a, temp it was almost like a template for life. Um, it, it's, it's got the message within it. It's timeless. Now, some of you will think, well, it's just, a, it's just a rock album. It probably is to many people, but this is uh, what I'm trying to get across is for anybody watching this, you will have an album in your collection where it somehow connects the dots with you in a way that maybe some other album never has done again. And it's very true that the music we hear in our formative years, I was like 14, 15. We don't forget that. And... Whether or not it does or not, the, the, out, the track called Rock the Nation has a line in it about putting your hand, hands on your hips and throwing your head back and shout, and when my homework is done. There was a song about getting your homework done and then going out and, and rocking and rolling. Um, and what a riff. And that's the other thing. <laughs> At my age then, I, got, I, I, just, I just love riffs. You know, I was getting to the Sabbath, Zeppelin. I was trying to hum the riffs in my head. Uh, Heartbreaker, Paranoid, NIB, Purple, um, one from Tokyo and stuff, um, Burn wasn't out yet, uh, 73 and stuff like Smoke on the Water. And then there was this band called Montrose where every single track had a killer riff. Every single song had a killer riff. There was no ballads. I wasn't very um, subtle in those days. I always think, oh, what's the slow track for? <laughs> I'm, I'm, more, I'm more kind of, my music tastes have 
uh, 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 wider now. But then I just wanted the rock tracks. And we're so used to now of heavy metal bands just doing metal throughout. But then it was quite rare. But there was still enough light and shade on this to cover every aspect of being a teenage kid, to being a bloke in your 20s or 30s or 40s. And even if you're in your 60s, there's still a song on here that just connects to you. So there was Rock the Nation, which was a statement of intent about, about this form of music, guitars. And, you know, you can see why they almost put them on the quote too, because there's almost a boogish background to the solo in Rock the Nation. And it's followed by Bad Motor Scooter. We have to have a song about motorbikes. And I don't think there's a better song about motorbikes than Bad Motor Scooter. Uh, and the way it starts, where the guitar, where Ronnie Montrose makes his guitar sound like a motorbike revving up, it's just fantastic. And Bill Church's bass, his bass lines on the get on your bad motor scooter and ride, it's just fantastic, isn't it? It's just absolutely fantastic. And at the end, when they do that bit, but you get on a bad motor scooter and ride and the guitar solo, just like the end of Whole Lot of Love, that the, the guitar on its own, it's just superb. But the best was yet to come. Third track in, this strange sound comes out, this ethereal science fiction based sound. And people, kids at school would be talking about this the next day after seeing this unknown band on the old grey whistle test do a song called Space Station Number Five. All of us are into sci fi, 2001, Daleks, um, all sorts of stuff. Space Station Number Five. And when it moves out of that experimental guitar intro and goes into that riff, one of the best heavy metal riffs ever laid down. And then it's followed within seconds by a gut-wrenching scream to rival Dylan or anyone else. And Sammy Hager is really good at screaming on Free Money on his solo album, The Red Album. He does it again. But on Space Station number five, my God, was that, that was the track. Um, I've played air guitar to that song at rock discos through the ages, I'm, I have to say. I think that that track has had air guitarists around the world changing their strings. <laughs> it's so cool. And, uh, you know, space and time making love. It was just Sammy Hager. What a, what a, what a vocalist. We're three tracks in. We're three tracks in and already... Everything is stacking up for me to say this is everything. And I was at school at a time when I was being pushed to get my hair cut um, to take on the first job I could find. So the fourth track is I Don't Want It, which is a song about making toothpicks out of logs and basically finding yourself in a dead end job. <sighs> Tick. Um, another another song that seemed to know exactly how I felt and um and I just loved it. And then within 15 minutes, it's time to turn it over to the other side. And really at that point in my life, I just want to have a good time. And we start off side two with Good Rocking Tonight with an absolutely killer solo, an absolutely wonderful shuffle. And boy, does this song rock. And then we're on to the next track, which is Rock Candy, which at this time... John Bonham was the seen as the drummer for heavy metal or hard rock. I mean, where Led Zeppelin wanted to see themselves uh, now, but then they were in that holy trinity of the British metal um, bands with Sabbath and Purple. But the start of Rock Candy, to me, was more powerful than what the production that Led Zeppelin had had. You know, Ted Templeman's dr how, the drum sound that he captured on Rock Candy and the statement, again, of intent... When Sammy Hager says, when you're 17, it's just absolutely timeless to every 17-year-old on this planet in 2021 to where you were in 1973. That song still kicks, as far as I'm concerned. And the guitar overdubs, they're everywhere. There's just like this ethereal wall of rock guitar and the guitar so I love you see I love Ronnie Montrose plays when he, most guitarists go straight to the upper register they blow all their cookies almost immediately but Ronnie Montrose 
would play down the lower register, like playing the solo, like on the, on the, on the you know, the D and the A string and moving and slowly moving up to a crescendo of emotion. You know, he just knew how to build behind behind these songs. Absolutely fantastic. Just incredible. We've got two, two songs left. By now, we're all exhausted. But where can we go next? Then we're back into pure, pure rock and, you know, a little bit of a little bit of kind of innuendo as well with one thing on my mind but it's a great riff slide riff and again every single riff every single riff is just incredible and when i say a bit of innuendo it's, it's rock and roll isn't it it's rock music but this is tasteful it's this isn't this isn't bands like bullet boys or danger danger in the late 80s where i cringed then there's nothing to cringe about here um you know this just works you just feel the, the energy, the youthfulness, the, the power of rock music in this song. And then after we leave that, we, we, to me, we hit the track for me, Make It Last. And the way Ted, Ted Templeman records this, it's like as if I'm sitting in the rehearsal room with Montrose. If I close my eyes, Ronnie Montrose is about six feet away and he plays that riff, a song written by Sammy Hager, one of the first songs he's ever written. And he can, you can almost hear, when well, you can, hear the heel of his hand dampening the strings as he moves through that riff. It's just a riff on its own before the drums and the bass come in. And it's a song about, again, being 17 and being 25 and always thinking that something else is going to happen. And then it's all about when you're 64. And it's just fantastic Ronnie Montrose is a flash guitarist but on this album he pulls back he lets the songs talk he lets the riffs hang you know there's fantastic separation between all the guitar dubs, of which there are many and he could be just firing off solos left right and centre but he didn't the solos are tasteful on target and absolutely incredible this album throughout my life has has been the album that if I'm not feeling great or i'm thinking of doing something and i want some inspiration i stick this on i remember being at um a party in the i think it was the late 80s it's a bit of a boring party and, and someone put montrose on the 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 record player and said god i just need a montrose fix and i thought a montrose fix i know what that means because sometimes you just need something that's going to wake you up and make you feel great and make you feel positive and uplifted and just think, yep, yeah, everything is possible. All the bets are on that this is whatever I'm about to do. It's going to work. Montrose. The album still has that effect on me. I've got um, several versions on vinyl because every time I see one, I feel like I have to rescue it. But it was a very, very sparse album cover. Pink. Um, the band just not wearing their shirts on the front and back. The track listing was just listed, it didn't make any sense. It says guitar dubs, nothing to read, no no facts and figures. But this was an album that in Kerrang did a best, was it 100 heavy metal albums of all time in the late 80s. And it came fourth in the late 80s. And even then the record label was still kind of being cruel to it, right? it they actually said, you know, absolutely fantastic record, and it still wasn't on CD. Of all these albums that I'm, I'm going to go through this probably another time, it still wasn't on CD. It it was word of mouth. People talked about it. You didn't find it anyway. It didn't sell. Over the years, it did, um, but it was an underground album, and it could have been. You know, the, they could have made Montrose one of the biggest bands on earth. I think Ted Templeman was so disappointed that his, his template for heavy metal coming from the States didn't take off, that when he actually got his hands on Van Halen, it was the first thing he made them listen to and said, this is what we're going to do. And and then that's a, that's a different story. So that's my overview of the Montrose album. But I thought, that, so which version, kids, should, should you get? Should you be looking for this? Well, the first one I'm going to show, I'm going to show you them all, um, but I'm going to show you the, the first one I managed to find, which is a US import because it was so hard to find. And then we'll look at the, uh, the Rock Candy remaster and then the two CD remaster from Rhino Records.
So here they are. Right, Candy's version is from 2009. And I have to say, it is absolutely superb. Anything about Rock Candy releases is absolutely superb. But um, Derek and his team did an absolutely wonderful job with this. You know, great little booklet. Extensive, really. Lots of great photographs. Fantastic live shot there. You know, and interviews with um, uh, various members of the band. It's absolutely superb. No extra tracks, but the sound on this is brilliant. So everybody was surprised when Rhino Records decided to revisit it and remaster it again in 2017. Now this is definitely worth having. It's two CD set with the album on one and the extras, the demos and the radio sessions from 73 on the other. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you get a booklet, nowhere near as extensive as Rock Candies, but obviously the print is a lot smaller, so they just crammed it in with an essay by Mike Mettler. Um, but excellent stuff. What you have here are on the demos, I'll probably be easier if I show you on the booklet, won't you, I think. The demos are one thing on your mind, shoot us down. Now this is where the magic happens. We all wanted to know, didn't we, when an album that was only 15, sorry, 15 minutes aside, did they leave anything off to make sure they got that absolutely dynamic sound? And they did. Shoot Us Down is a demo and it sounds fantastic. And you've also got demo of Rock Candy, Good Rocking Tonight, I Don't Want It, Make It Last. And then you've got the live um, gig from April 73, which is Good Rocking Tonight, Rock Candy, Bad Motor Scooter, Shoot Us Down. So it was in the set list, so it's a shame it did not make it. You're out of time, um, didn't make it either. And and you've got Royal Overbank Oven as well. So that's Montrose from 1973 and Warner Brothers Records. Um, I would, I can't really differentiate between the Rock Candy remaster and the two disc CD uh, remaster from, from Rhino. The, but because I'm such a fan, I find it very hard to be subjective. I would have to have both of them. The only thing I'll sum up on this video and is to say this book by Martin Popoff on the career and life of Ronnie Montrose is highly recommended and goes into absolute detail um, behind each album that Ronnie was part of. Um, absolutely brilliant book. So thank you very much for watching and thank you for your support. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for those of you who have come over and become patrons to support me further. I really do appreciate that. But thanks very much and I shall see you on my next video. Mm -hmm.